Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Dying Your Way podcast. Um, I am very enthusiastic and excited to introduce you to our guest today. Her name is Lisa Paul, and she is uh, one of the co-creators with Lisa, Lori uh, Cicero and Lisa Paul together created the Death Deck, which is um, five stars on Amazon. And it is also, I checked, it's in Amazon Australia. Um, and we're going to be talking about that at the end of this um, interview. But the reason why I wanted you to meet Lisa and, and to talk to Lisa is she is a, a licensed clinical social worker. And 15 years of her you know, experience has been devoted specifically to the hospice area. And so she's been witness to many deaths and uh, a lot of challenging circumstances that people do face at the end of life and their families. And as a social worker, they are a, a very important and critical part of a palliative care team in some cases. Um, I, I have to admit, with the people that I have supported in death, I've never worked with a social worker. And I know there is great, great benefit to what they bring and what they do. So I thought we'd spend this, this interview finding out um, about that role as part of the palliative care team and just expand all of our education about um, ways that we can go through a death journey and incorporate a social worker into part of our team, know when to ask for one, when we need one. And I just don't know those answers. So I thought, who can I, Lisa, I'll <laughs> ask Lisa to do it. So uh, she's a lovely human being. You're gonna love meeting her. And I'll introduce you now to Lisa Paul. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Claire. It's so nice to be here with you. Yeah. And I, I love the opportunity to talk about social work. It is, um, it's my career and my passion, mm. just as end of life is. So, um, you know, we've done quite a few podcasts talking about the death deck and uh, which I love to talk about, but I haven't had the opportunity to talk as much about um, social work and the yeah. role of the social worker. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and, and I really have so many questions. First of all, you're in Huntington Beach, California right now. That's where you are. You're close. Uh, okay. Redondo Beach, Redondo, so a okay. little, uh, little north of there. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. But, um, so Los Angeles County, and uh, rather than Orange County, but yeah. uh, on the beach, which it was a beautiful and eighty-five degrees today in February, so it was lovely. Well, I'm in in uh, Peppermint Grove Beach, Western Australia, and it's probably going to be about eighty-seven today, and we're five minutes <laughs> from walking on the beach. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's hear it. We'll get out there today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I will. I will. Um, so as I said up at the top, I, I have not worked with a social worker, and I know that they are a critical part of a palliative care team. And when I think back, particularly to my parents passing, um, I knew there was a social worker on the hospice group but they never really promoted that. I never knew to, I did not know to ask for it. And then six years down the line, when I really did need a social worker, um, my mother was transitioning from having spent down her income in Alzheimer's long-term care. She um, needed to go into from Medicare to Medicaid and that was just a bureaucratic nightmare. And I realized on my own, I wasn't going to figure that out. So I spent the money for an attorney to do that for me, realizing later on that I probably could have gone to my hospice that I was working with and gotten help from them, but I didn't know. You know, so anyway, I'm going to let you talk and just tell us basically what is the role of a social worker in general, and what is it in um, a hospice scenario? Sure. So um, I have been a social worker. I got my master's in 1999. I was one of those few 
lucky people who um, decided I wanted to be a social worker and went straight from undergrad to grad school. And um, man, I, there's so many times that I've been so grateful that that was the path that um, just came to be for me. So, um, so I've been working as a social worker since 1999 and have worked in quite a few settings. Um, but what I found was with mental health, the role of the social worker with mental health, of course, is, is kind of more of a, a therapy type of um, experience. Uh, people who get their license in social work, at least in the United States, can then practice as a therapist. Um, so it's a, it's a counselor, it not only a is counselor. a counselor, mm -hmm. but it's a, is that part of a social worker degree is counseling? It's all social work. So okay. that's the beauty. That's one of the things that I really love about social work. And I think the closest career is kind of nursing because mm. you can work in so many different fields. And mm. when you, what I found was when I got burnt out in one, okay, let me try something new. So I did yeah. domestic violence and rape crisis. And then I did community mental health. And then I did hospice for a bit. And then I took a break and worked in emergency medicine. And then I came back to hospice. And so um, it's, the flexibility of the degree has been um, a huge benefit. Mm. And I think it's a great reason why it's a good career choice too, because yeah. it, it really lends itself to being able to use, you know, these core skills that you learn in school um, and then apply them in these other mm. settings, of course, with sometimes with additional training, of course, and those sorts of things. But um, so my role in the hospice team is primarily to provide emotional support and resources for the family. Those are the two big items that I'm responsible for. Mm. Um, so some of the resources might be if they, if the family um, does not have mortuary arrangements yet, it's my job to talk with them about that and talk to them about their options and kind of help that conversation along, which is a delicate one. Um, <laughs> and um, some of the other resources are caregiving agencies. Um, you know, in California, we have in-home supportive services so that if someone is on Medi-Cal or Medicaid, they can qualify to get some in-home help covered. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's a challenge and all of these factors, but um, so there's programs like that, that we are, uh, that we have knowledge about that we're talking to families about and potentially veteran benefits. And, yeah. um, and we also work with the patient and family to look at where they are now and what care they may need. Uh -huh. So, you know, helping prepare for because we guess you know there's some hospice patients who come on that are uh living independently yeah and and then it, it becomes what are we going to do when you are not able to be independent mm -hmm. um so it, the hospice i currently work at i love it is um we have about a 90 to 100 patients, which I feel like is a really nice amount because we're big enough to absorb um, staff being out and that sort of thing, but we're small enough to not, not feel like a number. Um, yeah, yeah. And what I really like about, I, I've worked there six years at this yeah. particular hospice. And what I really like is that the culture of this hospice is the nurses and social workers do joint visits, um, especially the first Oh, that's visit. great. That's, so see, we that's come great. out with the nurse, meet the family. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I, I don't give them an option. I say, I'm the social worker that's been assigned to your case. I'm coming out to meet you. And then, um, you know, sometimes people say, no, oh, we don't really need anything else. Um, but usually once you get your foot in the door, people are welcome to have the support. So, so when you, I'm jumping in here, but mm -hmm. when you go yeah. in for that initial meeting, 
Um, and I, I, it's great to hear that you just automatically go out with the, I guess, the case manager, or the lead yes. nurse on that. Um, what, what are you doing when you walk through that door, assessing the situation and how you might help? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So w one of the beautiful things about hospice and um, particularly home hospice, which mm -hmm. uh, most of our team is, is home. We have some facilities um, patients, but most of, most of the patients are in their own home, which is That's lovely great. to That's me. That's great. Yes. And so um, we walk in and, you know, it's always an honor and a privilege to be in someone's home. And I always, you know, take a moment to remember that because I'm stepping into their space. Right. And when you go into someone's home, they can't really, they can't cover up what's happening. And so yeah. you see, um, you know, you see the grandkids, uh, all their toys, you see pictures of the patient when they're young, which I love. Yeah. And, and so the first is kind of a glance to see, um, you know, to assess the situation and figure out who yeah. lives there, what kind of support does this person have? And so I'm, I'm assessing, um, you know, how much support do they have? How open is this family to talking about illness and death? Mm. Uh, how open is the patient to this? Mm -hmm. um, the nurse and I together are kind of assessing where we think this person is in the dying process so we can start to give some education. Um, we love to use Barbara Karn's book, Gone from My Sight. Oh, that's great. And several others, but yeah. um, that's kind of a staple, especially as you know, sometimes well, a lot of hospice patients are near the end of their life when they come on the hospice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we walk in and we're trying to get an understanding right away. of. of I've heard of that, the, that the average of the United States is about two and a half months that a, a patient is on hospice in the United States. Yeah. Yes. And also, I think it's between 40 and 50% that only live two weeks or less. So, mm. you know, some people are around for a year and that helps boost that two and a half months. And then there's a, there's a lot of people who come on right at the end. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm establishing a relationship with the family. Um, explaining hospice services. So the nurse is kind of taking vitals and um, starting to look at medications and I'm uh, gathering more history from the family and um, beginning to look at what their caregiving plans are. Quick question. So sure. have they already been um, given as a referral and accepted to hospice when you and the nurse go in there or are you doing that in that visit? So typically um, some hospices have social workers do part of the initial presentation mm -hmm. for hospice and talk about it, which I think is great. Social workers are very qualified to do that. Um, our particular hospice, uh, we have admission nurses that are, you know, trained for those conversations. And then the social worker comes with the nurse once the patient comes onto hospice. Mm -hmm. And so in the States, you're supposed to assess within five days, the social worker and the chaplain. Um, and we always try to do it the very next day or day two because of how quickly people can decline, sure, sure, how many yeah. resources they may need. Um, yes, so in this instance, it is, uh, but social workers can be utilized in the role of the admission team too. So the, the, you're looking at the home, you're looking at the family support system that may or may not exist. I'm sure you're looking at the, the way they move in their home and the safety mm -hmm. factors that yes. are involved in their home. Um, would you be the one that would call in say an occupational therapist or um, somebody to help them navigate in their home better or? Yes, we, um, so palliative care and, and, and hospice, at least in, 
in the states are are different um, in terms of what they what is covered and what is provided. Mm -hmm. So um, in hospice, typically you can have a physical therapist or occupational therapist, but usually the limits, the visits are pretty limited yeah. and it's teaching the family and teaching right. the patient like safe transfer and those right. sorts of things, yeah. um, which we definitely, we, we utilize our, the physical therapists um, mm -hmm. to, to do that and help us. Our nurses are pretty great at that too. So, um, Oh, the training so that I got from family. hospice as a caregiver was fabulous. It was, yeah, I couldn't have done it without them. Um, I lost my train of thought. So I was going to ask the other the things were, question. We're, it's gone. we're helping. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's going to come back. Um, you know, we're helping people adjust to their limitations and right. adjust to their illness and their prognosis and, and helping the caregivers adjust to their roles. Um, mm. I mean, some people have been in a caregiving role for years and years and are really tired. Um, and sure. so a lot of my time is spent supporting families, um, supporting the caregivers. There's more of that than patient. Um, support, I would say, because of the limitations mm -hmm. on how people are feeling um, and how able and open they are to having um, the support. Would you they, say that most of those at-home patients are there and using hospice so they can actually die at home instead of at a facility? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes, I would say that. And, and and occasionally we do have patients that want to be home, but not die there. Yeah. And, and so that is kind of, that's another time in which the social worker is, is in that role of, okay, we need to now find, you know, a board and care or inpatient hospice, if that's appropriate, mm -hmm. um, and try to navigate that because some people are worried about how their loved one will handle them dying in the home um, but not not that many people usually I found mm -hmm. that when when there's young kids in the home sometimes that's you know Lisa as long as you've been doing this I you've probably seen the changes that have happened to the Medicare criteria in in the years because when my parent my mother died in 2010 and my father died in 2007. So from 2005 to late in 2010, I was a primary caregiver for both of my parents. My father was on hospice for two and a half years. He went on and off of it, but you know, they were a constant presence for two and a half years. My mother was on hospice for six years. Oh my God. I mean, what, what a difference that made to my experience as a caregiver to have that kind of um, just extra set of eyes and ears and knowledge that, I mean, I didn't know anything at that point about taking care of anybody, <laughs> you know, my kids yeah. and me, and that was it. So it was, um, yeah, I couldn't have done it without hospice, but at that time, I was lucky enough that there was not that six month, you know, arbitrary. I don't know why they came up with that, that arbitrary, you know, you've got to be six months from death to uh, even well, get this benefit. What's, what's interesting. Did, did your parents have Alzheimer's? Is that my mother had Alzheimer's? She had started out with a failure to thrive uh -huh. diagnosis. And then as the disease progressed, it went to Alzheimer's, but that was her first diagnosis. And I really don't think that, you know, that was being misused at all, you know, mm -hmm. as, as far as Medicare, because, you know, the, um, I, my mother and I both just had such great benefit from it. You know? Well, now they call it severe calorie malnutrition. So there's okay. still workarounds. Yeah. <laughs> there's still workarounds. And I, I've had patients on for four years. So um, it, it does still happen. You have, you know, the hospice has to carefully document 
um, signs of decline. Mm -hmm. There needs to be, um, uh, it, it, there just needs to be a lot of diligence um, if keeping someone on that long. But the, the six months or less is the criteria to come on. And it is, you know, with heart disease and dementia illnesses, um, neurological disease, it's so difficult to predict I know. Uh, how long someone's going to live. And so, and of course, once you're in the home and you're supporting them, we never want to leave. I mean, I can't tell you how many team meetings the doctor will say, well, they're up for research again. And the nurse and I are saying, they still qualify. This person qualifies for hospice. This person needs it. And so we go to bat and we, you know, usually can persuade. And, um, but, you know, I tell but, people, I tell people that I work with, you know, go ahead and ask for the referral. Mm -hmm. All they can do is say no. You can go on it, you can get better and then go off of it, but you've already established that relationship. Mm -hmm. You've already established that trust that you have in your end of life care through hospice. And it's just so, e so easy to get back on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we do have some people who, who um, feel better once they're on hospice. Which is good. <laughs> yes. I mean, they, they're getting more support. The family is getting more support. There's a nurse checking on them once, twice, three times a week, um, managing the symptoms. And so some people, especially people who've, um, you know, kind of been faltering in and out of the hospital, the fatigue of hospital and doctor's visits is just getting them down. Oh, yeah. If they can just stay home for a few months and have the medical team come to them and really address their symptoms, sometimes they really are feeling better. And then, and then the family says, maybe we don't need hospice, you know, and then, then, then that's a different. Yeah. Um, then, then yes. But I agree with you. I but think they, you, but they probably end up coming back on hospice after a period of time. And like I say, <laughs> that, that relationship and that um, paperwork that needs to be done, it's already there. It's just, you know, renewing and refreshing. So um, when the pandemic hit, how did that affect the people that you were serving? Oh, it's still hit. It's still affecting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but luckily we're, um, LA is starting to, to get a little better again. Um, but initially we were, the social workers were, were pulled out of the field. We were, um, we were then doing either video or phone visits for mm -hmm. a period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, how was that? You know, some of the families really loved it um, because they were able to kind of have more one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I could call the daughter and, um, and she could not be with her mom and we had a little more privacy. So for mm -hmm. some families, it worked out really well. Yeah. Uh, for others, you know, we weren't there when they came onto hospice. We weren't there when they were dying. It's much harder to establish a relationship mm. with somebody over the phone. Yeah, so, um, sure. so when we were given the green light in the summertime, um, then I, I was happy to go back out in the field. Although now we keep going back and forth with the level of PPE we have to wear. And, um, you know, some families still prefer uh, extra people not coming into the home. Yeah. So, um, but the beauty of hospice and palliative care is that it is, it is patient and family driven. Mm -hmm. So really that is, that is what you should be looking for when you are looking right. at a provider, a team of people is what are the goals, you know, for the patient, what's the goal for the family. And then we're there to support those goals. And so, some people really like having the social work and chaplain support. And um, I've had some that have me, that want me to come every week. And then I have some that say, we'll call when we need something. So it really depends on, or, or I'll say, 
well, I'll come about once a month. And then the nurse calls me and says, I really need help with this daughter. Can you come with me tomorrow when I meet with the daughter? <laughs> and see, so, that's what I love. You're working together as a team, yes. you know, and there's that mutual respect for the different things that you bring to the situation. Um, so is the um, case manager, the nurse, is that, or the doc, who is the lead of that palliative care team? Um, it's, it's really the case manager, the nurse, mm -hmm. the RN case manager that's going into the home. That's mm -hmm. the point person. And that's the person mm -hmm. taking the lead. That's the person that's going to see the patient the most. Um, and, uh, and then the other disciplines are kind of supplementary that, well, that's not true. We're all integral, but that's right. the person that's going to put the eyes and ears, you know, going to be with the patient and family the most often is going to reach out for help um, yeah. as they need it and kind of keep updating us. The physician, at least in, um, in my experience, the physicians don't make a lot of visits in hospice. Right. You know, it's primarily the nurses who are reporting mm -hmm. back to the physician. Um, if families request it, then, um, then of course, but typically uh, it's driven by the nurses who are really highly skilled. Yeah, so you, you touched on earlier that um, it, there are a lot of people that actually don't have family, don't have support. And do you play a larger role in that case to kind of be that surrogate support system for them? And are you yes. there when they die? Those, those are the harder, the harder patients. Um, harder emotionally we, or the harder? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. All of it because yeah. they need, they need more. And, um, and so what we try to do is, is always really explore what that support system is and could be, mm -hmm. you know, okay, you do have a cousin. Where's the cousin? <laughs> Let's get the cousin here, you know, because we don't want as the hospice team to be the only support for this person as they're right. dying. Right. Uh, someone's going to have to manage things. And so, but when there is limited support, then that usually does mean that the social worker and, and sometimes chaplain are increasing our supportive visits. Um, we are continuing to try to rally some support for that person, but also, you know, talk with them. You need to make their funeral arrangements now. Uh, we need to get that handled so we know who to call. Um, and, you know, some people are more open to those conversations than others. Sometimes people really refuse to talk about next steps, which um, is hard. And so, well, you know, it's, it's denial, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's denial. We, we're all subject to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I also do this. Um, and I think the, the social worker um, can help also just give space for the anticipatory grief that a patient and the family may be fe mm -hmm. feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So that grief that's coming at the idea of losing someone, the grief that comes at seeing them sick, at mm -hmm. seeing their decline, the grief that comes as watching someone um, with dementia become less and less of the person they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when we can tap into and acknowledge and give space for that, it opens the door for more um, acknowledgement of next steps and we can kind of move along. Um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about the anticipatory grief and I've interviewed several people just on the topic of grief work and things like that. And in interviewing people and in my own experience, I'm just convinced that to be resilient in these tragic situations, that there needs to be some sort of education or focus put on uh, preparatory grief or getting, getting, um, 
putting things in place so when it comes, you're just not, you know, without any kind of um, ability to internally and externally deal with what we're things we're all going to face loss, all mm-hmm. of us. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I, yeah, I'm just a real believer in, you know, doing my meditation, doing my journaling, doing my walks by the beach, making sure I have a friends <laughs> and, you know, mm-hmm. relationships with my family and stuff that are healthy, you know, and yes. it's, You know, that may serve me in the end, it may not, but I don't think if people were were playing the death deck and playing and thinking about this way before the need was there, I think they would really see how important it is to prepare for loss, whether it's your life or someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we, you know, talking about, hard topics is it's it's uncomfortable it's difficult but like everything else it becomes you have to practice you Mm -hmm. know and and the thing with talking about death is that I think people people say they don't want to talk about it say they don't want to think about it but when you open the door and you start a conversation, people have a lot to say (laughs) about it. They have a lot of beliefs about it. They have a lot of fears about it. I mean, it's a huge topic. And, you know, to the fact that we exist in a world where it, in, in so many cultures, in so many ways, it's still so difficult to talk about an inherent part of life which is that we're all going to die. And, and I do feel, I mean, the families that I go into who are prepared, who the patients made arrangements, um, you know, for let's say cremation, it's already done. The family um, has been talking about the service for years because the patient you know, says always, you know, I want the scripture at my service, that the families that are open to the conversations about end of life and death, it, there's a peace in the room. Um, and, and usually we can focus more on the, the quality time together. That's the goal. You know, that's the goal of hospice. That's the yeah. goal of good end of life is quality time with people that you love with your symptoms managed and um able to focus on enjoying that bowl of ice cream Mm -hmm. and watching jeopardy with your family and so i i love when i am able to work with families that that really have gotten there yeah um and that that's really one of my favorite aspects of of the job. Yeah. And by seeing what is, I mean, I always put this in air quotes, a good death, then you have, and you've seen it over and over and over again, a, you don't have the fear of, you know, your own circumstance, but you can give examples and you can share with the clients that aren't prepared you know, in a way that really has gravitas to it because you see and you know what a difference it makes. I mean, you can't lead a horse to water and make him drink, but, you know, it's, it's grounded in anecdotal experience. There's a lot of studies on it um, that it just, the quality of life at the end of life is very um, malleable, you can make that happen. And, um, yeah, I just, that's my mission is just to get that word out there, but I want to talk about the death deck. Well, let me tell you a a story real quick, because you just made me think of something and it it's, it's, it's a delightful story in that I had this, uh, patient, um, a gentleman, I think he was about 90 years old. Um, and he did not want to talk about his illness. He didn't want to talk about his death. And um, <laughs> his wife was at 
her wits in because she didn't know what he would want. Um, right. Burial cremation. She didn't, she felt at a loss. And, um, and then he, uh, he started actively dying and was no longer communicating. And I got a call from the wife and she said, Lisa, Lisa, you got to call me back. And she sounded really kind of excited. And I was like, this is interesting. You He's know. actively dying. Lisa, <laughs> He's Lisa. dying, but I, was, she, I, I have no idea what's in store for me when yeah. I call. Yeah. And I called and she said, I found an envelope. And he had an envelope that said, when I die, and he not only had already made arrangements for a burial, which thankfully she found this, um, he also had listed the accounts and his retirement, the attorneys, he had it all for her. Mm. And she was so excited and so relieved and told me that she had been laying by his side, kissing his hand, thanking him as he lay dying because she oh. thought she was going to have this big old mess on her hand and he didn't he did not do that he he did prepare um he was an engineer that did not want to talk mm -hmm. about things but he had taken action and i just i think of her and that excited phone call and i think about like if we only knew how much easier we could make it oh <laughs> for our goodness. loved ones because you know, nobody it, wants to do that to their loved one. Nobody wants to like make them go through so much heartache and hassle. Well, and I'm, I, I mean, I'll just pitch in here too, that part of the preparation is communicating that you have pre prepared. That's yes. part of the preparation. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> that, that, um, that is one, he, he could have done that better. <laughs> well, yeah, luckily she found the envelope. Um, gosh, there's so many things I still wanted to talk to you about, but I, I don't want to like spend all the time and not get to uh, the death deck and talk about your relationship with Lori and how the death deck evolved and um, yeah, how you use it really. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it, the death deck came from the ideas that we're talking about the idea that we are, um, that by having conversations throughout our lives about death, we'll get better at it and we'll be able to um, be more prepared, take action. And it originated um, from a relationship with Lori Lo Cicero. Her husband was on hospice for pancreatic cancer and I was the social a, worker. A young husband. A very young husband, 44. Yeah. And so um, they had two small children. And, uh, and so I came into the home and, and provided support to Lori. Um, he was young. And so young people, it takes quite a while to die. Um, uh, he had, as I said, pancreatic cancer. And so we spent a lot of time together. There were young kids and she, she welcomed the support. She wanted all the support. And, um, and so after he died, she asked if I could continue coming for grief support. And um, fortunately the hospice I worked at was flexible and we kind of were able to do what we felt was appropriate. And so her and I met in her backyard week after week um, for grief support. Um, she also had her kids in grief support groups and all these other things. So she was doing all this stuff. And, um, you know, we ended up kind of ending the relationship because I couldn't come forever and said, you know, let's maybe we'll connect in a couple of years. Uh, fast forward a few years, she reached out to me. She had been writing a book. We started spending time together. And uh, from that time, we began talking about how unprepared Lori felt for Joe's death and how many things that she wishes she had known and that she would have been better able to advocate for him and better able to know what he would want and what he would want after he died. And, and she felt kind of robbed a little bit of what she felt like could have been less chaotic and, and all of these things. So, um, so we decided to create a game that Lori says she wishes she could have played with Joe. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, some of the cards are open-ended, but the bulk of them are multiple choice. And um, the idea with the multiple choice questions is that it takes some of the hot seat off of somebody when you are given options for how to answer. Right. Just right. as we know from school, right? Yeah. <laughs> Multiple choice <laughs> tests. Yes. I don't want the essay. Statistically so, pick C. Statistically yes. <laughs> always pick C. <laughs> exactly. So we thought um, the other reason we chose multiple choice questions was that it, it lended itself for us to insert a little humor in there. Yeah. So um, our goal was to create a lighter tone um, insert a little humor and just loosen people up a little bit about this very important topic. Um, and one of the things I really like uh, to, one of the ways I really like to play is guessing each other's answers. I think that, you know, if you partner up, you and Terry partner up and guess each other's answers, oh, that's the, great. I the love conversation, um, I mean, first of all, we've learned that a lot of friends know each other better than their spouses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and it's very lively, you know, yeah. when you get when you get people guessing each other. Do you answers. have do you have the the card there that you can hold it up? I mean the pack hold it yes. up close so they can see it. Yeah. So that's the death deck right there. And it's a how many cards are in there? 112. Yeah. 112 it's cards, so much yeah. fun. I mean, I, we've, we've played it with the other doulas that I work with and, you know, we've done it on Facebook live things. I mean, it's just so much fun. It really is. Oh, I love to hear that. Well, you know, we, um, we love doulas first of mm -hmm. all. Um, yes. My hospice even has, uh, we have a doula program now, which I, is so exciting wonderful. so wonderful. We're, we are able to bring in doulas for our families oh. um but one of the ways that doulas uh that we've seen people using it is is trying to provide these community um education opportunities you know providing uh game nights or activities for people to just just dabble in the conversation. And uh, there are some cards that lend itself more to advanced care planning. Mm -hmm. And so um, we also have uh, health agencies and people using the deck for kind of getting meetings started, getting started talking about advanced care planning, um, which has been really fun. I mean, the goal the goal is for it to be used anywhere and everywhere. But well, I mean, I'm I'm really aware that it's in everyone's awareness in the United States. I mean, people that are, you know, in these circles, everybody uses it. It's just oh. great. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> no, that's wonderful <laughs> to hear. That's wonderful to hear. We've, I mean, it's been really rewarding to um to have created something that again, we hope just helps people start these conversations. And, um, you know, people will sometimes be like, or say things um, like, well, I don't, I don't want to think about that yet. I don't, I'm too young to talk about that. Or, um, but if you just, if you just get used to it, or you, you have a conversation with your spouse, significant other now about something you can you then have a place to start you have a I've place found to that I've to. found that in some ways millennials are more open to having this conversation than say a baby boomer you know but if you yes. have a baby boomer grandparent that you care about you know or a parent that you care about you know you can actually use this as a tool to get the mm -hmm. conversation going and um, yeah not them put up barriers thinking that you know you're waiting for them to die you know it's right. just <laughs> right well and we like to call it stacking the deck but you know you you know your audience and so yeah. I I always encourage people to look through the cards ahead of time and and be thoughtful about what you you know what is what might your grandparents be open to good good and, point Good point. 
I mean, if you're playing a, if you're playing just a party game night, feel free, just grab a card. But when you're really trying to start a conversation and it might be a little more sensitive, I would Mm. say, take a look. Good point. Good point. Well, okay. We could talk about so much and we'll have to continue the conversation, but I know that I I really want people to know they can buy the death deck through Amazon and I'm sure it's in bookstores and other places that they can. So if people want to a get more information about the death deck, but actually wanted to reach out to you to find out more information about social work or, or the psychosocial support that's needed at the mm-hmm. end of life, um, what would be the best way for people to, to be in touch with you or to find the death deck? So uh, you can purchase the death deck on Amazon or on our website, thedeathdeck.com. We also are on all social media um, at the death deck, mm-hmm. same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a Gmail, uh, the death deck at Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can also reach me specifically Lisa at the death deck.com, but okay. if any, the death deck.com, you can go to our website and do a, um, a reach out there as well. So just remember the death deck and you'll be able to. To connect with us and i'm happy to talk to people about social work mm. hospice um the death deck any of those topics i think and- people will listen to this interview and be inspired to um well hopefully prepare early but to to think about how important it is to have that kind of social and psychological support at the end of life that a social worker gives and help to navigate a lot of things that you wouldn't even think you'd have to deal with at the end of life, but a social worker would know about that. And that's why it's so important to highlight this role to our listeners. And, and if you're in another country and you're listening to this, there are uh, social workers and they may have a different kind of context because of the medical systems that they have that are certainly different than the United States, but the United States does death pretty well, better than a lot of countries. And I've, I'm really appreciating that more and more. So um, Lisa, thank you for your time. I'm just so happy to see you again. You too. uh, Thank you. Thank you, Claire. It was really great. I feel like we could have talked three more hours. Easily. (laughs) But I I need to end my day and you need to start yours. Yeah. And so give my love to Lori too, will you? I will. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye.